Let's take a look at some practice problems dealing with some ratios, proportions, and percents together. If you'd like to download a free copy of this blank PDF, you can find a link to that in the description box below, where you can also find the annotated answer key PDF as well. I encourage you to grab some paper, something to write with, and let's do some math together. In this first problem, we know that a light bulb factory is going to be producing 12,500 total light bulbs. The ratio of light emitting diodes or LED bulbs to compact fluorescent lamps or CFL bulbs is going to be at a ratio of two to three. So right away, I'm gonna write down the ratio of LED light bulbs to CFL light bulbs, and that's gonna be a ratio of two to three. Now, if we know the ratio of LED to CFL light bulbs is two to three, then based on that ratio, there would be a total of five light bulbs there because two plus three is five. Now we know they're producing a total of 12,500 light bulbs. And so that's gonna be related to the total number of light bulbs here. So we're gonna say that's going to be 12,500 and that's gonna be where the total is gonna be. Now, if we have a total of 12,500 light bulbs, that means that is going to be uh, 2,500 more than five, right? So if we're gonna keep the same ratio here, we should also multiply uh, both the LED light bulbs and the CFL light bulbs by that same value just to keep it proportional. So let's go ahead and multiply everything by 2,500. And if we do that, we're gonna find out that if we do that, we would have a total of 5,000 LED light bulbs for every uh, 7,500 light bulbs. So same ratio. And you can see here that the total, if you add those amounts up, is going to be that 12,500. Next, we're told that of the LED, next we're told that of the LED light bulbs produced, which we now know is gonna be this 5,000, that 3% of these light bulbs were going to be defective or they weren't good. So if the company does not produce any other kind of light bulbs, the question is, is how many of the LED light bulbs were not effective? So if 3% of the light bulbs were defective, then when we look at this amount that's not effective, that's going to be a total of 97% that are not defective. So for the amount that's gonna be not defective, that's gonna be 97% of that 5,000 which is gonna be the same thing as 0 0.97 multiplied by 5,000, just because of means we're multiplying. And so we know that of those 5,000 LED light bulbs that were produced, 4,870 of them are going to be not defective or they're going to be good. This right here would be our answer. Here's number two. In number two, we see that in 1950, scientists examined a certain animal population in a particular geographical area to be 6,400 people, and that's gonna be in the year of 1950. So I'm just gonna go ahead and write that down here. So that's gonna be in 1950. However, in the year 2000, we know the population is now going to be 7,200. The question is, is if the animal population experiences the same percent increase over the next 50 years, so 50 years later, then what is going to be the approximate population of these uh, number of animals when we take a look at this to the nearest hundred? So notice we have this as the year 1950, so 50 years went by, so that's going to be the year 2000. So when they say 50 years later, they're really talking about the year 2050, so they're wondering what is that population going to be? So first we have to figure out what the percent increase is from the year 1950 to the year 2000. So the percent increase formula is gonna be the amount of change that occurred between those two years divided by the original amount. Once we divide that, we're gonna multiply this by 100% and that'll get us our percent change or percent increase here. So the amount of change, if we go ahead and take this uh, 7,200 and take away 6,400, we're gonna get that the population changed by 800 in that time span of 50 years. The original population in the year 1950 was 6,400. So let's go ahead and divide that over there. Then we're gonna go ahead and multiply this by 100% after. Now, if we divide 800 by that 6,400, that's going to be 0 0.125. And if we go ahead and then multiply that by this 100%, we're gonna get this percent increase, right? So if we multiply this by 100%, we're gonna get a percent increase of 12.5% here, or 12.5%. So, so if we told that we're gonna have the same percent increase here, we have to also go up by 12.5%. So we have to find out what 12.5% of that 7,200 is. Now keep in mind that we went from the 6,400 to 7,200 and we increased by 12.5%. That was a change of 800 in the population. Now when we go from the 7,200 to this amount in the year 2050, even though we're going up by 12.5%, we're not gonna be increasing by 800 because we have a greater population. So it's gonna be a bigger number here. To figure out how much the population is changing by, let's go ahead and take this 12.5% of the 7,200 for that population. If we go ahead and do that, remember 12.5% is just really 0 0.125. Of means multiplication, so we're gonna multiply that by 7,200. 
we go ahead and multiply those two together, we're gonna get a total increase of 900 more that's gonna be added on to this population, right? So if we take this 7,200, we found out that the increase of 12.5% is gonna be 900 more. So if we add on the 7,200 plus the 900, we're gonna get a new population in the year 2050 of 8,100. So in the year 2050, if we have this population increasing by the same percentage of 12.5%, we can expect the population to be about 8,100 of those animals. Let's check out number three. In number three, if the ratio of five to seven A is equal to the ratio of one to B minus A, we have to figure out what A over B is equivalent to. All right, so let's go ahead and just rewrite this uh, ratio of proportion rather. And our goal here is going to see if we can get this A over B ratio by itself. So right now, it doesn't really look like it's in that form, but maybe we can use some of our uh, background knowledge to figure out how to rearrange this a little bit. So I'm gonna go ahead and maybe see if I can use cross products to change this around a little bit. So I'm gonna multiply seven A times one. The product of those two values is always gonna be equivalent to the product of these two expressions. So seven A times one is just going to be seven A. And then on the other side of the equation, if we have this five multiplied by this B minus A, uh, we can go ahead and write it like this, right? So keep that B minus A in parentheses. Uh, maybe we can rearrange this a little bit more. Let's go ahead and distribute this five to both of these terms inside here. If we do that, we're gonna get seven A is equal to five B minus five A. All right, so again, at least we don't have any fractions right now, but we have to somehow get this expression of A over B. So let's go ahead and see if we can combine some like terms here. I'm gonna go ahead and use the addition property of equality and just add on 5A to the right side and add on 5A to the left side. If we go ahead and do that, we're gonna see that we have 12A is gonna be equal to 5B. And then if we go ahead and divide both sides here by uh, B, then we're gonna have at least A over B on the left side of this equation. So if we go ahead and do that, I'm gonna go ahead over to the right, get a little more space here. So we're gonna have 12A over B, and that's gonna just be equal to five, just because those Bs are gonna cancel out on the right side of the equation. And then if we go ahead and just divide this left side here by uh, 12 and divide this uh, right side here also by 12, just using division signs to make it a little bit more clear. And the 12s are gonna cancel out and we're gonna get A over B on the left side. And on the right side, we're gonna get five over 12. So the ratio of A to B is gonna be equal to five to 12. So this is gonna be the ratio or the value of A to B, right? It's gonna be five to 12 or five twelfths. All right, here's another problem. In number four, teachers at a certain school know that when reviewing for exams, the number of topics they can cover is directly proportional to the length of time that they have to review. So that just means that we can set up ratios or proportions here. If the teachers can cover nine topics in a single 45 minute period, the question is, is how many topics? So that's what we're gonna to try to find. How many topics can they cover if they have one hour to review? Now it's important to know that we have some different units here. So we have minutes and we have hours. Uh, you can either turn the 45 minutes into three quarters of an hour, but it might be easier for uh, more people to say that one hour is the same thing as 60 minutes. So let's go ahead up and set up a proportion here. We know that they can cover nine topics in 45 minutes. So the question is, is how many topics can they cover in 60 minutes? So let's go ahead and put the time on bottom here and let's go ahead and see if we can figure out the amount of topics and that's gonna be X on top. Now that we set up a proportion, cross products is probably gonna be the quickest way to do a lot of these problems. So we can see here that if we multiply 45 times X, that's just gonna be 45 X. We can go ahead and just write those next to each other. And then on the other side of the equation, nine times the 60 is gonna be 540. We can go ahead and just use the one step equation and divide both sides by 45 using that division property of equality. If we go ahead and do that, the 45s cancel out to make one. So we can say X is going to be equal to whatever 540 divided by 45 is, and that's gonna end up being 12. And so if the relationship is proportional, like they told us in the problem, if they can cover nine topics in 45 minutes, then if they had a full hour, we'd expect them to be able to cover 12 topics in that full hour. Here's number five. In number five, we know the ratio of freshmen to sophomores in an auditorium is going to be three to 10. Setting up a ratio here, I'm just gonna use F for freshmen and S for sophomores, and I'm gonna write this in fraction form of three to 10. 
And then we find out that after an additional 270 freshmen and 120 sophomores are going to enter the auditorium, the ratio is going to change to 6 to 5. So how are we going to show this? Well, we could write another proportion here. This time I'm going to say the number of freshmen, we don't know how many that is, but increased by 270, all right? Uh, the ratio of that over the number of sophomores, that's going to be increasing by 120. So the ratio of freshmen plus 270 to the number of sophomores plus 120 is going to end up being a ratio of 6 to 5. The question we're being asked is how many freshmen were there in the auditorium before we knew that there were more students that were entering this auditorium. Basically, we're going to be solving for the value of f. Since fractions can be a little messy sometimes, let's go ahead and use cross products to just write equations that are not in fractional form. So uh, if we multiply this uh, diagonals uh, here for cross products, we're going to say three times the number of sophomores is equal to 10 times the number of freshmen. So there's one equation that we can use. And then if we go ahead and use cross products again for this uh, second proportion or equation we have, we can see that five times the number of freshmen plus 270 has to be equal to six times uh, the number of sophomores plus 120. Now we have two equations that don't have any fractions, which is pretty nice. Uh, for the equation to the right, it's a little messier, so let's go ahead and clean it up a little bit. So let's go ahead and use the distributive property and distribute the five to both terms on the left side and the six to both terms on the right side. So five times the number of freshmen plus five times this 270, let's do 270 times five, that's gonna be 1,350. That's gonna be equal to six times the number of sophomores, or 6s, plus six times 120, which is going to be 720. We can't clean everything up here, but we can combine some of the constant terms. So let's go ahead and take away 720 from both sides of this equation. And when we do that, we're gonna see that five times the number of freshmen plus whatever 1,350 minus the 720 is gonna be, that's gonna be 630. And that's going to be equal to six times the number of sophomores. So how can we use this equation to the left with this equation to the right here to solve? Well, we do have two equations and two variables, which is actually kind of nice for us. Um, I'm noticing right away that we see this 5f is just half of 10f. So we could take half of this 10f to turn into 5f, but then we'd have 1.5s if we divide them both by 2. It might be a little bit easier to obtain this uh, 6s over here. So if we go ahead and double this uh, 3s, we would get 6s. So 6s would be the same thing as 10f times 2, right? So let's go ahead and just multiply uh, this equation over here by two on both sides. And if we do that, we're going to see that six times the number of sophomores is going to be equal to 20 times the number of freshmen, right? So if we know that this 6s is equal to 20f, then this 6s over here can also be swapped out for 20f. Let me show you why that's going to be helpful. Uh, if you go ahead and make that substitution, then the left side of the equation stays as 5f plus 630. The right side, we can just replace that 6s or substitute it with 20f. Right now, why would we do that? Well, now we just have one variable in our equation and we can solve this, right? So having two equations and two variables is pretty nice because you can use substitution or you can use elimination, a couple different methods to solve for a variable. So let's go ahead and now just subtract 5f from both sides of the equation. If we go ahead and do that, then we're going to see that 630 is going to be alone on the left side of the equation, and that's going to be equal to 15f on the right side of the equation. Finally, let's go ahead and use the division property of equality, divide both sides by 15 here. And you can see that 630 divided by 15 is going to equal 42. So we're going to say the number of freshmen is going to be equal to 42. So again, at the beginning, we were looking for f. We just found out that f is equal to 42. So before more of these students entered the auditorium, we know that there had to be a, a 42 freshmen before that. All right, so that's going to be the solution to this equation or this problem. All right, here's number six. Number six, all the attendees at a symposium are either going to be biologists or physicists. We have two types of uh, people that are gonna be at this place. Uh, we're told that there are going to be 123 physicists and 270 of these biologists. So setting up a ratio here, we know that we have 123 of these physicists. I'm gonna use P to represent those. And then B is gonna represent the number of biologists. That's gonna be a ratio of 123 to 270. We're then being asked how many additional physicists, so more people are gonna enter the room, but they have to be physicists, must arrive at the symposium in order for the ratio of physicists to not biologists, but total attendees, so everybody there, to become this ratio of two to five. 
So if we know that in the beginning we have this 123 physicists and 270 biologists, we can add that together to know that there's a total of 393 people before more additional physicists are coming into the symposium. And so what we're gonna do here is set up a situation that we know is happening. So we have the 123 physicists. We know there's gonna be more physicists entering the room, so we don't know how many there are gonna be, but we're gonna go ahead and say it's gonna be plus X. So that's gonna be the additional physicists that come in. And they're asking about the ratio of physicists to total attendees. So how many are there right now? Well, right now there are 393 total people before those additional people walk in. But once those additional physicists walk in, there's going to be a total amount change as well, right? So however many people walk in that are physicists, that's gonna to add to the total number as well of people in the room, right? So the ratio after these people walk in is gonna be a ratio of two to five. So we can go ahead and set up a proportion like this, all right? So here we can go ahead and maybe solve for X, which is going to be the additional people that are walking in. Again, just like many other problems here, uh, using cross products is a very nice way of solving these types of proportions where we have a ratio equal to another ratio. So using these cross products here, let's go ahead and say uh, two multiplied by this 393 plus the uh, additional physicists that are walking in. All right. That's gonna be equal to five multiplied by the original 123 physicists plus those additional physicists that are walking into this room. All right, so here we have an equation. Now there's no uh, fractions, which is kind of nice. Let's go ahead and use the distributive property, multiply two by each of these terms and multiply five by each of these terms as well. So on the left side of the equation, if we double that 393, that's gonna end up being this 786 and it's gonna be plus this 2x, all right? On the right side of the equation, if we multiply five by this 123, that's gonna end up being 615 plus five times the number of additional physicists as well, all right? Now we just have to combine some like terms here uh, by using some of our properties of equality. So maybe what I'll do first to keep some positive values here is let's go ahead and take away 615 from the right side and 615 from the left side. And if we do that, we're gonna get 171 on the left side plus two times the number of additional physicists that are coming into this room. And that's gonna be equal to five times the number of physicists, okay? Next, let's go ahead and combine all these x's to the uh, right side by taking away two x from both sides of the equation. And if we do that, we're gonna get 171 is gonna be equal to three x or three times the number of those additional physicists. Now, we're gonna go ahead and divide both sides by three. Uh, we know it's gonna come out to a nice number because of the divisibility rule. One plus seven plus one is nine. So we know that nine is divisible by three. So that means that 171 is divisible by three. So if we go ahead and divide 171 by three, we're gonna find out that X is going to be equal to 57. So how many additional physicists must have walked into the room to get that ratio of two to five? We're gonna say 57 of these additional physicists. This would be our answer. Let's take a look at number seven. Riding her bicycle, Yao can travel one mile in 5.5 minutes. So I just went ahead and wrote that as a rate in fraction form here, and we know that she's gonna be going at a constant rate, so we're gonna be dealing with a proportion or equivalent ratios to the nearest whole number, what is the distance that she's gonna travel in 1.5 hours. All right, so let's see what's going on here. For the 1.5 hours, we should go ahead and see if we can turn that into minutes just because we have units in minutes already. So for 1.5 hours, uh, we're gonna go ahead and say, well, one hour is 60 minutes, so uh, we know that one and a half hour is gonna be 60 plus 30, because that's 30 more minutes, so that's gonna be equal to 90 minutes. That's what one hour is. So if we're gonna go ahead and set this up, we can know that the 90 minutes is gonna go on bottom just because we put time on the bottom of our rate to the left. And let's go ahead and see if we can figure out how many miles y'all can travel in that 90 minutes. So it's just really important to make sure that we take a look at the units first and make sure we have consistent units here. Now there's different ways you can go about this problem, but the theme that I've been kind of going along with all these other practice problems is just using cross products. It's usually just the quickest way, especially if you have a calculator. So if we go ahead and use cross products here, 5.5 minutes times X, we can just go ahead and write 5.5 X, and that's gonna be equal to this one mile, or one multiplied by 90, so I'm just gonna say that's going to be 90. Next, let's just go ahead and divide both sides by 5.5. That's gonna be on both sides of the equation. 
and we divide both sides by 5.5, we're gonna get x is gonna be approximately equal to about 16 point, I'll write 36. Well, I guess it's 36 repeaters, so it's exactly this value. So I'm gonna go ahead and actually put that as a direct equal sign here instead of approximately. And we're being asked to do uh, this to the nearest whole number here. So I'm gonna go ahead and say it's going to be about how many miles? We're gonna say about 16 miles. That'll be how far Yale can bike in 1.5 hours. So if Yale can bike one mile in five and a half minutes, if she keeps that constant rate, then if she has 90 minutes, we'd expect her to travel about 16 miles. So hopefully number eight looks familiar to another problem we did earlier. So if you wanna go ahead and try this one on your own, I really encourage you to do that to see if you can solve it. All right, so here is our original uh, ratio of proportion set up here. So we know the ratio of X plus Y to X has to be equal to the ratio of four to nine. What we really wanna do is see if we can get this uh, expression of y over x or y divided by x alone by itself. Uh, and so let's see if we can rearrange some things here. Uh, typically, we just like seeing if we can uh, get rid of these fractions because it might be easier to deal with, sometimes a little intimidating the way it is. So if we multiply four times x, that's going to be four x. That's one of our cross products. The other cross products is gonna be nine multiplied by the quantity of this x plus y, or the sum of x and y. Let's go ahead and just uh, distribute this nine to both of these terms inside here using the distributive property. If we do that, we're gonna get four X is equal to nine X plus nine Y. Let's see if we can get X and Y on the same side of the equation here. So it looks like we can combine some like terms if we move the nine X to the left side or move the four X to the right side. I uh, kind of want some things on both sides of the equation here. So let's go ahead and take away nine X from the right side and take away nine X from the left side. If we do that, we're going to end up with negative 5x on the left side, and on the right side, we're going to have this 9y left. So we're trying to get y to be over x, so let's go ahead and keep the y where it is, and let's divide both sides by x, so we do end up with a y over x expression. Uh, we do need to do a little bit more, but on the left side, if we divide it by negative 5x by x, we're going to be left with negative 5. And on the right side, if we do this 9y over x, we can't really do anything, so we're just going to keep it as 9y over x. Uh, then let's go ahead and just get that y over x by itself. We can go ahead and multiply the right side by 1 over 9 or just divide it by 9. Whichever one makes uh, more sense to you is perfectly fine. So if we go ahead and divide both sides by 9 here, we're going to end up with a ratio of negative uh, 5 over 9. Uh, and that's going to be equal to, and then the 9 and 9 will cancel out, so we just have y over x. So what is y over x equal to in this particular uh, ratio or expression, y over x is going to be equal to negative 5 to 9. All right, in number nine, let's take a look. We uh, see that they have an emergency room doctor that's going to prescribe a certain amount of pain medication that's gonna be delivered through an IV drip. She prescribes 800 milliliters uh, of this medication to be delivered over the course of eight hours. So I'm just gonna go ahead and set that as a rate to begin. If the IV is gonna deliver one milliliter of medicine over the course of 30 drips, the question is, is how many drips per minute, we're gonna find a different rate in different units, are needed to deliver the prescribed dosage. So we're gonna find an equivalent rate rather, however, the units are going to be different. Right now, our units are currently in milliliters per hour, and we're gonna see if we can get this in drips per minute. So let's see if we can do that by maybe using some dimensional analysis here. So first, let's see if we can get rid of the milliliters here. To get rid of milliliters, we need to know how many uh, drips are in a milliliter. So it says in the problem that we have 30 of those. Now we know in the problem that one of these milliliters is equal to uh, 30 of these drips. So I'm gonna go ahead and write uh, that as equivalent here. So one milliliter is equal to 30 drips. Now, the reason why I'm putting the milliliters on bottom is so that when we multiply, the milliliters will cancel out. And if we just finish this uh, right now and solved it, it would be in drips per hour. And if we were to go ahead and just solve this right now, we'd end up with an answer that's gonna be in drips per hours. But remember, we want drips per minute, so we have to get rid of this hour over here. So let's go ahead and see, we can multiply by another uh, unit rate conversion here. And so one hour is gonna be the same thing as how many minutes? Well, that's gonna be 60 minutes, right? So if we go ahead and put the hours on top, notice the hours on top will cancel out with the hours on bottom. And then we should be left with just two units that we're looking for here. One of the units is going to be drips and the other is going to be minutes and we're looking for drips per minute so this hopefully makes sense if we multiply this 800 by 30 by 1 on top that's going to be uh, 8 times 3 is 24 we should have three zeros here uh, and that's going to be this many drips I'm going to write 24,000 drips 
in how much time here? Well, it looks like we have eight times one times 60. So eight times six is gonna be 48. We need another uh, zero here. So it's gonna be 480 minutes. And if we go ahead and divide that numerator by the denominator here, we're gonna find out that it's gonna be 50 drips. And that's gonna be per one minute. This is how many drips per every minute that needs to be given to this patient if we wanna keep that same rate that the doctor is prescribing. All right, here's number 10. In number 10, botanists are studying a particular coastal redwood tree and they determined that the tree grew uh, 46 meters in the first 50 years of its life. On average, how many centimeters per day, so it looks like we have to convert units here, uh, did it grow during this period? Assume that there are 365 days in a year and we're gonna round our answer to the nearest hundredth of a centimeter. So here is our initial setup for our rate of 46 meters in that first 50 years of life. So it's going to be on average, how many is this in centimeters per day in this time period? So it's not gonna be the same every year, but on average, so we're gonna keep a consistent proportion or rate of change here. So let's see, we have to convert our meters uh, to centimeters and we have to convert our years to days here. So let's see, what kind of unit conversions can we use? Uh, let's use time first or convert the time first. Um, we, we know here that the uh, one year is going to be the same thing as 365 days. It's not a leap year or anything. So let's go ahead and put 365 days. That's going to be on bottom here. The reason why we're doing this is uh, we want these years to cancel out similar to the last example. If we just solve this right now, we'll have meters per days, but that's not what we're looking for. Uh, we do want days, but we want centimeters as well. So uh, let's convert the meters to centimeters. So one meter is gonna be the same thing as how many centimeters? I'm gonna put the meter on bottom and that's gonna be equal to uh, 100 centimeters. Now, why did I put the meters on bottom this time? Well, I would like the meters to cross cancel. So if we go ahead and just look at the units we have left, we have centimeters and days, which is what we are looking for, all right? So let's go ahead and just multiply uh, the numerator values together. So 46 multiplied by one multiplied by 100 is gonna be 4600, zero, so 4,600 centimeters in how much time? Well, it looks like on the bottom we have 50 multiplied by 365 multiplied by one, and we should get 18,250 days. So while this is how much it's gonna grow in centimeters in 18,250 days, what will this end up being if we divide it to get it per one day? So if we take this 4,600 and we divide that by 18,250 per one day, we're gonna get about 0 0.252. This is how many uh, roughly centimeters per day. And it does say in the directions here that we're gonna to go to the nearest hundredth here. So we're gonna say it's gonna be about 0.25 or almost kind of a quarter, right? One fourth, one fourth of a centimeter per day. And so it kind of makes sense to measure this in centimeters instead of meters, just because in one day a tree is not really going to grow a lot. So using a smaller unit of measurement is going to give us a little better idea of how much it's growing. All right, let's check out number 11. In number 11, a college athletics program found that approximately 3% of the 308 runners get injured during workouts and approximately 6% of 237 uh, weightlifters are gonna get injured during workouts. The question is to the nearest whole number, so we're gonna round any decimals with the whole number at the end. The question is, is what's the total number of runners and weightlifters who were injured? So for the injured runners, it looks like 3% of those 308 runners are getting hurt. So if we go ahead and do this, uh, you could just go right away to turning this percent into a decimal. So it's 0.03 or three hundredths of means we're multiplying. So we can go ahead and find out 3% of 308 or uh, three hundredths multiplied by 308. If we do that, we're gonna get about, uh, or exactly rather in this case, uh, 9.24 uh, runners are getting hurt. So a little later, we will round this, but exactly out of 308, uh, 9.24 runners are getting hurt. Now, as for the weightlifters, it looks like it has a bigger rate here of getting hurt. So it looks like it's gonna be 6% of these 237 of these weightlifters. Now, 6% is gonna be 0 0.06 as a decimal, or 6 hundredths of, again, means multiplying. So we're gonna multiply this by 237. So if we go to multiply 0 0.06 by this 237, we're gonna get that 14, 0.22 or 14 and 22 hundredths of these people are going to be getting hurt. Now, if we want to get the total number of runners and weightlifters who are getting injured, 
we can just go ahead and take this 9.24 and add on this 14.22. Again, I would advise you here to just round at the very end, don't actually round during. So uh, we have this 9.24 and add on the 14.22. That's gonna be 23.46. Now, if you're gonna go ahead and round this to the nearest whole person, right, because you can't really have 0.46 people uh, in, in real, real life get injured here. So we're gonna say that they're gonna be about 23 because we're rounding to the nearest whole number. Uh, we're gonna say 23 people are going to be injured in total. All right, here's number 12. In number 12, we know that a painter has 20 gallons of a paint mixture, and this paint mixture is going to be uh, consisting of 15% blue. The question is, is how many gallons of a mixture of more paint that is going to be 40% blue pigment would the painter need to add to get a total mixture that is going to be 20% blue uh, as opposed to the 15% blue initially? So we know we have an original amount of paint that is going to be 15% blue. And we're going to be adding more paint to this, but this paint is 40% blue instead of 15% blue. Once we mix these two amounts of paints together, the goal is to end up with a mixture that is 20% blue. Now the first amount of paint over here that we know is 15% blue, we know that there are 20 gallons of this amount of paint. For the one that is 40% mixture, they're not telling us how much we're adding, we have to figure that out, so that's gonna be X gallons. Now when we add on this 20 gallons plus this X gallons, we should end up with a total of whatever the 20 plus that X is going to be, and that's gonna be measured in gallons. So of this 20 gallons of initial paint, we know 15% of it is going to be blue, so if we go ahead and say 15%, of those 20 gallons. That's essentially how we can set up that first uh, mixture. This next part is going to be 40% of this amount that we don't know, right? So it's going to be 40% of X, okay? This is going to be equal to, uh, and then this total is going to be 20% of the total mixture. So it's going to be 20% of whatever this uh, 20 plus X expression is going to be. Cleaning this up a little bit, 15% of 20, 15% as a decimal is gonna be 0.15. Of means we're multiplying, so we have 0.15 times 20 plus, and then this 40% uh, is gonna be 0.4 multiplied by X. So we can say this is gonna be 0.4X, 40% of whatever that mixture is going to be. And that's gonna be equal to 20% of whatever this is going to be. So 20% is going to be 0.2 or 2 tenths and of this amount is going to be that 20 gallons plus that x gallons. So this will be our equation that we can solve here. So if we find 15% of 20, that's going to end up being 3. So 3 gallons of this paint is going to be blue. Plus, we don't really have anything we can do here. That's just going to be 40% of whatever uh, that amount of paint is going to be. And then on the other side of the equation, let's go ahead and just take this uh, 0.2 on the outside and distribute it to both of these terms on the inside. So 0.2 or 20% of 20 is going to be 4. So I'm going to write 4 plus and then 20% of X we don't know. So I'm going to leave that as 0.2 X. All right, so we have a, just a basic equation here that has one variable, so we can go ahead and solve this. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and just combine the x's uh, first here, but totally your choice. I'm gonna take away 0.2x and take away 0.2x on both sides of the equation. If we do that on the left side of the equation, we're gonna have three plus, and then 0.4x take away 0.2x is gonna be 0.2x and that's gonna be equal to four on the right side of the equation. Next, let's just go ahead and take away three from both sides of the equation, so we can go ahead and just get the x term by itself. If we do that, let's go ahead and just get some more room over here. Uh, we're gonna get 0.2x is gonna be equal to one. And then finally, if we divide both sides by 0.2, we should get x completely alone here, or one x. And then we're gonna get x is equal to, and then one divided by 0.2, or one divided by 1 fifth is going to be five. So the answer to the question, we're gonna be adding on five gallons of that mixture that is 40% blue, and that should end up making the entire mixture uh, be 20% blue, just because if we add a higher concentration of blue to something that's lower concentration, it's gonna raise it up a little bit. And we're raising that concentration of 15% blue up to 20% blue. If you're wondering how much mixture there will be total, essentially we're adding 20 gallons plus five more gallons. So we would have 25 gallons of paint at the end and it would be a little bit uh, higher concentrated in blue than it did before. All right, so there you have 12 different practice problems on applying our understanding of ratios, rates, and proportions and applying them in some different contexts to solve some interesting problems. 
If you found the video helpful, please consider giving it a thumbs up and sharing with a classmate or friend who might also find it helpful. And as always, keep it the great work that you're already doing.